Everybody and welcome back to Board Game Breakfast. Well, the Kickstarter is over and I think it finished successfully. I say I think because I'm recording this before it's over. Um, I guess it could co conceivably collapse, in which case I don't know if I put this video up, I'd be so sad at that point in time. But either way, once again, thank you guys. And now we're done really talking about raising money and now it is time to get full blown into the year. February is not a month that is full of conventions. There is some things going on like New York Toy Fair or anything, but we're not going to any of those conventions. So this is more still of a preparation month for us. We get airplane tickets and hotel rooms and things for many of the conventions throughout the year, but we're like getting ready, but we're also finishing up reviews. I mean, I got piles of reviews all over the place that need to get done. We still have stuff from Essen. There's probably even still a couple games that are hanging around from Gen Con, probably. But be besides all that, the things still go on here. February is the shortest month of the year, so we'll try to stick in a few extra things to make it feel like it's as long as the rest of the months. Today I'll be doing a question and answer time a little earlier than normal, so I'll be doing it at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so if you want to come by and ask questions, there's even a link uh, in the video for um, that I'm doing live that where you can go and ask some questions or vote on other people's questions even if you can't make it live so maybe some of your favorite questions will get answered during that time frame. So without further ado, let's get to the, oh, before I forget, Dice Tower Cruise is still open if you want to get on board. I don't know when it will fill up but there's still some slots open. Check out DiceTowerCruise.com for info. Anyhow, to the news. All right, let's just jump right into this. First of all, in sad news, not really sad news, the Sentinels of the Multiverse universe is ending. Now, I mean, partially this is this is kind of Kickstarter news. They have a new Kickstarter going on, but I do like Sentinels of the Multiverse. I very much remember when it came around, and so it's kind of interesting to see this fade out. I thought maybe there would be more games set in it, but I don't know. Maybe there's this never say never thing about it too, but we'll see. Uh, r, r Games has announced that there's four new expansions coming for Time's Up. Yes! With 250 cards each. Yes! I don't know if these expansions are themed. It doesn't look like they are, but hey, more cards for Time's Up is never a bad thing. Ares has announced that it's working in conjunction with Pendragon to create a game called Last Friday. This is a game of hidden movement where one person is a serial killer and hunting down campers, it looks like, at camp. So essentially... You know, kind of a Friday the 13th rip-off type, type situation. But that sounds interesting. I'm not a big fan of horror or of serial killers. Um, but the idea, this is a new theme that we don't see a lot done in games, especially with the hidden movement Scotland Yard type thing. So who knows? That might be really good. Harebrained has announced that Golem Arcana is done, finished, and that they're ceasing support for it. Now, for those people who have it, I would not worry about it because some entrepreneur person out there will get some sort of thing going where you'll be able to play it. But this is interesting because this was the next big thing. For those who don't know much about it, it was a miniatures game where you could like, there was like the special pen and you could scan the bases and the bottoms of them and then move them around on the board and do different things with them. Uh, but it was an app too. The app was kind of like the main focus of the game. And when they fought each other, the app would tell you who won. You could actually play the entire game without the app. Well, it was much more difficult, and it was kind of this neat concept, but apparently way too expensive. Hmm. Was, is this going to... I don't know. I'm just curious to see how this trend goes in the future. AlphaGo, a computer created by Google, has beat the European champion of Go, and is actually have a game I set up, I think, for April, playing against a world champion. Now, Go has many, many more combinations than chess does, so this is intriguing. I, I did not think that some, a computer would be able to beat a Go player for many years, um, but it has happened, so it's curious. Um, just interesting to watch artificial intelligence get better in that regard. Pokemon! has a Super Bowl ad. Here, here's part of it. You can do 
I know that big deal. I'm not a huge Pokemon person, but that's kind of cool. It's the first time I've, I th can think of where one of the biggest times where you can have an ad over the course of the year is done by a card or board game. Maybe someday you'll see a Catan ad there. Eh, probably not. Um, Z-Man Games is no longer exclusive with Alliance. They'll be moving to the big five distributors, just like Asmodee announced uh, a few weeks ago. And then Mr. Eric Martin is over at the Nuremberg Toy Fair and has been tweeting all sorts of things. By far, the thing that's got everybody talking is the fact that there is a new pandemic Cthulhu, Pandemic Reign of Cthulhu coming from Z-Man Games at Gen Con. Now, this is not designed by Matt Leacock. It's with Matt Leacock, but it's designed by Chuck Yeager. And uh, who knows what it's about, I'm sure. There, there's lots of internet speculation. It's like some people are saying, no, more Cthulhu. Other people are like, ooh, more Pandemic. Some people are like, not Cthulhu, but I do like Pandemic. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Who knows? Uh, either way, yeah, we'll, we'll certainly try it out. He also, uh, he has a lot of news. You can go check out the Twitter feed for Board Game Geek to find out about this. But these are things that struck me. The new expansion for Dominion. So two expansions ago when they said this is the last expansion. And then they made Dominion Adventures and said, okay, well, there's going to be one more. Apparently, forget it. We're just going to have Dominion expansions forever. And this one's Dominion Empires. That is pretty much all that I know. Hobby World has had some cool stuff. Spyfall 2, which we're not going to see in America until 2017. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Spyfall requires you, Cryptozoic, to simply make picture cards and put them in a box. The rules were already done. I, I don't get it. I, I will never understand why Spyfall is so hard to find. It's such a simple game and very popular. But I'm still glad it's coming out. Also, Hobby World makes a love letter Star Wars. <laughs> Unfortunately, because of licensing, you're only ever going to find that in Russia, but you can know it's going to go, people are going to be wanting it over here. But ah, they're making a Masters of Orion board game. Remember that great video game, that amazing video game? Yeah, board game. Also, some other stuff like we're seeing Agricola. There's a family version of Agricola coming, an upgrade kit if you got the original Agricola, not all the new cool stuff. And there's a new game coming in the gift series. Whew, that's pretty cool. Maybe I should have been at Nuremberg to find out all this information. Maybe next year. Hey, folks, that's the news. Let's get to the Kickstarter news. Happy breakfast, everybody. Let's take a quick look at what's happening in our crowdfunding world today. Karmica is a card game for two to four players all about rising from a lowly dung beetle up the karmic ladder to achieve transcendence. Actually, this game was designed by the team behind a really cool indie app game called Osmos, so between that and the beautiful art, Karmica got my attention. You get cards that have points and special abilities, and you can play the cards, or you can also store cards for your future life hand, which is kind of cool and thematic. But also when you play a card, it opens it up to be taken by your opponents into their future life hand. So that creates some really cool interplay. If that sounds interesting, check it out, and a copy of the game will cost you about $25. There are two underwater theme games up right now. Adapt is a game about fish fighting each other and adapting their bodies to win those battles. The game plays two to three players and it includes three sets of snazzy looking polyhedral dice. And Scuba is a game about diving, observing sea life, and maintaining your air. I always think the underwater theme is nice and it's great when a theme that's not overdone hits the market. Strife Shadows and Steam is the standalone expansion to last year's Strife Legacy of the Eternals. This two-player steampunk card game pits players against each other in duels over different territories. Each player has an identical deck of cards, so the strategy really comes in from having perfect knowledge, gauging what your opponent is going to do, and timing your moves perfectly. It's also cool that some of the cards have special abilities that activate if they're on top of the discard pile. Strife features tarot-sized cards, and a copy of the game is just $15. Thieves Market is the latest from Tasty Minstrel Games, which means it's going to have great art and great components, which in this case means you're going to get some really cool custom dice. This is a dice drafting and engine building game with a touch of negotiation and player interaction because you can steal dice that your opponents previously drafted, but the draft isn't done until everybody says it's done. This looks like a fun, quick game and a copy of the game is just $17. Okay, that's all that I have for you this week. If any of that looks good, go check it out on Kickstarter. And until next week, play all the games. This week is Groundhog's Day in America. 
If you're like me, you'll be traveling to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania for the Groundhog Day celebration, which involves hours of driving through the cold so you can sleep on a cot in the cold gym of a local school because all the hotels are booked. So you can stand in a huge crowd of cold people so far away that you can't possibly see a small road and get terrorized on national media. And you stand around more in the cold. Then you go get something warm and then you drive home in the cold. So naturally the question is, what games can be played in the cold? No, 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 of course not. The only thing I might remotely do for Groundhog's Day is watch the Bill Murray movie. So the question there is, Jared, what games can be played over and over again? What games, so to speak, can be played into the ground? Hog. Well, if you're looking for repeat play, the game I recommend the most is Dominion, which I played dozens of times in real life and then online at Dominion Isotropic, no judgment, over 3,200 times. The sad part is I never really got that good. But in terms of physical copies of a game you can play a lot, I have to recommend the simple tiny games, like Love Letter and No Thanks. Man, I take these games with me everywhere. Not just because they're so portable, though they are, but because they are perfect compact games that bear indefinite repetition. Now, is instead the perfect Groundhog Day game the new Ghostbusters game? Which would serve as kind of a nice Bill Murray, Harold Ramis crossover homage? I really can't say since I've never played it. But if it's ever put online, I will probably play it, no judgment, over 3,200 times. So happy Groundhog Day to all of you out there. Happy Groundhog Day, everyone. Hey folks, I didn't put it in the last episode, but it is here today, the end of the Dice Tower contest. Uh, for promoting the Kickstarter, I told people to email me when they did it. I got uh, hundreds of responses to that. And so what we did is we picked some random winners from all those responses, and here they are. Now, you might be looking here at the list of random winners. If your name is on this list, I need you to email me and say, hey, I won. And as soon as you do that and give me your address and stuff, we will send you one of the random prizes that are from Dice Masters, from WizKids, and from uh, Cosmic Encounter, which is from Fantasy Flight Games. So some of those will be going to the different folks of you. And I want to say a big thank you to um, the companies for supporting this. Uh, this is something that we're going to be trying to do a little bit more of in 2016 is having these contests in Board Game Breakfast. So maybe some companies are watching this now and you want to get on board with these contests. We just want to make them kind of exciting and interesting. I don't want to, hand, you know, do something where there's like one winner. I think it's more exciting when there's several winners possible for these because then more people can win. Like this one, we have nine winners. I like that. Uh, it gives people a better chance of winning and so on and so forth. So anyhow, congratulations to all the winners. I look forward to hearing from you. Keep on, keep it on. Hey folks, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Today's question comes from Shane, who says he likes playing games with his wife and his kid, but he wants to play heavier games, which they're not interested in. He doesn't have anyone to play them with. So he wants to know how did we meet our closest gaming friends? Well, there's lots of ways. When I was in New York, I uh, went to stores. I went to the Complete Strategist, and then that's how I met some people originally. I also looked online in different things like uh, back then it was Yahoo Groups, but now there's things like Meetup, so you can find people online. Um, those are the two biggest things I would recommend is, you know, either go to your local game store and try to find people if there are other people interested in board games or look online also, obviously, Board Game Geek is a big resource for finding people. If you don't have a local game store, which is possible, that's not close, then yeah, the, that, is the, that would be my first choice. For, hey, is there a gaming meetup? If not, advertise one. You never know. Some of those guys who play Magic or other card games may actually also be gamers looking for something. But also, Board Game Geek, you can sort people out by where they're from. When I first moved to Homestead, I looked to see who the gamers were in Homestead. And then Meetup, definitely. Meetup and Facebook. There's, there's a lot of ways online. Just go to Board Game Geek and pick the region you're in and say, hey, I live in such and such a place. And yep. I bet you people will say, hey, and you may have to travel an hour to go meet someone, but that I, may be worth it. I travel an hour to come here all the time. Well, 45 minutes, but still. <laughs> well, right, but if you really want to play heavier games, you can. And as the time exactly. goes by, things grow, and you'll meet people who live closer, possibly. Conventions. Um, World Board Gaming Championships, I've been going there for 20 years and I met a lot of people who are into heavier games there and then some of them live close by and then you 
get you know friends. Also, obviously, I met a lot of my gaming friends in college. I, I'm guessing most of the people that watch this are out of college already, but <laughs> you meet a lot of people in your college game clubs as well. I joined the board gaming club when I was in college, and they're all good resources to meet people. All right. Well, let us know if you find someone. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Send us questions at dicetower at gmail.com. Previously on German for Board Gamers. Okay, okay, okay. This is getting ridiculous. You know what? Since this is the last regular episode, you'll find this cheat sheet in text form down below, either in the video description or in a comment. In this episode, I'll talk about buzz. Real buzz. In English, the voiced S z, is used for Z. No, the other Z. X at the beginning and S at the end. In German, a single S is usually voiced and a double S is not. This crazy thingy is a spelling variation for double S and a way for German teachers to distress their students. Z and X, on the other hand, are never a voiced S. They are TS and X, respectively. This, combined with the R and H, is why German maybe sounds a little orcish to you. All right, just two examples today. Hexentanz. Hexentanz. And this is game designer and publisher Klaus Zoch. Klaus Zoch. Well, that's it. You've reached the end of the series. While there are some letters I've not talked about, you should be able to pronounce most German words in a way that German speakers will understand. If you haven't done so, look up the other episodes in Board Game Breakfast 108 to 112. So, is this goodbye? Well, it depends. Is there a German board game or designer you would like to pronounce correctly? Maybe you have a more general question? Ask away in the comments. I might do a few Q&A episodes in the future. Otherwise, enjoy this great hobby of ours. And I bid you farewell. Hi, welcome to Painting Miniatures 101. This week, Battling Brushes is back with Sam and I. So, in honor of that, I figured I'd take a look at the figures from Arcadia Quest, the paint job that we're going to be doing for the entire month. Let's take a look at the figures and see how they stack up. Too many or not really outdid themselves with these sculpts. No bendy swords, no crooked or flash marks. Just great quality miniatures. And in this game, this is some of their best work. I know that you guys like to see things painted, but I hope you'll join Sam and I this week on Battling Brushes as we're going to be painting these sets and showing you how to do it each and every step of the way. But I have to say that these are some of the best minis I've seen in quite a long time. So let's take it up top and see what I finally think on these beautiful, gorgeous minis. So there you have it, Arcadia Quest. Beautiful, beautiful minis. I painted three boxes of this so far, and I've yet to find an imperfection, and or a bent sword or anything. Just well done, and some of the best miniatures, cool mini or not, has done thus far. Well put together, beautiful, beautiful set, great sculpts, and wonderful to paint as well. Good for the beginner and good for the professional as well. Lots of enjoyment out of them. Well, that's it for this week. Be sure to join me at my channel on YouTube here, Robert Oren. And, and be sure to join Sam and I this week for Battling Brushes as we do Arcadia Quest. Until next time, I'm Rob Oren. Have a great week. <laughs>、hey、folks, from the Dice Tower this week. I have、uh, several reviews that are coming.、Uh, Jason and I are going to be taking a look at both Nautilus Industries and a classic game,、uh, Sam Bessie. Orphan Black, the board game we'll be taking a look at, and a couple smaller games, including the classic Saboteur and Ho Yuck. And so there's several things that are coming out 
um, from the Dice Tower. We're also going to have a top 10, our top 10 cooperative games. Now, we've already done a top 10 cooperative, but we felt like it needed to be redone. So that's coming out this week, as long as one of our pop culture top 10s kind of sort of, you'll see when that one comes out. And there's some other stuff that we'll be putting out, different videos throughout the week from Sam and Z and from our contributors. There's a lot of things that you have forward to, to look forward to. And of course, you can find out all our podcasts and all that stuff. You can find that at our website, dicetower.com. Andromeda's even on here. Have you ever noticed just how big the universe is? I mean, no matter where you go, there it is. Hi, I'm Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise, and recently I've started wondering if this universe is so big that it may not actually revolve around me. <laughs> That's crazy talk. But what's more, some even consider that this universe, this one that we call home, may not be the only one, referring to the billions of alternate universes imagined in every book, movie, comic, and community theater production of Les Miserables. Kidney of a horse, liver of a cat, filling up the sausages with this and that. Some of these universes exist only in one medium, but some. Some are so strong, so vibrant, that they can successfully spill over into multiple forms of entertainment. And these, these crossovers are great. They're a great way to not only expand those universes, but also simultaneously sell 12,000 crates of your top-notch merchandise that people will just crawl through broken glass to purchase no matter how forced the product integration may be. Regardless, my point is that the board games based on the Star Wars universe have historically been hit and miss. Yet, that universe remains strong enough that even characters developed in secondary media until recently had become canon. And one company out there that's done a pretty good job of adapting properties from other media into board games is Gale Force 9. Their roster of games includes Spartacus, Firefly, Super Showdown, Homeland, and Sons of Anarchy. All games based on other universes, but still all strong enough to stand on their own as games. But what about the other way around? Are there any universes that started out in board games that are strong enough to be adapted into other mediums? No, just stop it. No. Well, next time, we'll travel into that quadrant of the board game universe to start exploring that idea. Andromeda! I found it. Hello, welcome back, Cyril's Brettspiele. My name is Niels, and today we are talking about in the best and the worst about Neanderthal, Sierra Madre games. Have fun. My favorite part on Neanderthal is, first of all, I never expected so much stuff in a small box like this. Cards you use in any direction. There are so much information on it. Even this pad here, you have two sided. So it's so deep for just a tiny box. And the best part ever is you have from page 26 up to page 35 science notes. So this is like a science paper, like a science magazine to learn about the evolution of your own species. And this is exactly also the flip side of the game. This game is more a doctor thesis, not really a doctor thesis, but it's more a science journal instead of a game. There's player elimination or could be player elimination in the first couple of minutes. It's a punishing game so you are dying every single second. There is so much luck involved by just rolling dice. I mean scientifically it's totally correct and theme wise it's perfect and brilliant. But who? It's more a piece of art instead of a game for me. Okay, please let me know in the comments your favorite part on Neanderthal or what you hate on that game. And see you next time. So let's play Spiele. Bye bye.
of the questions that often comes up in online discussions and that people talk about is, are we in a board game bubble? You know, oh, board games just seem to be growing and growing and growing and growing. Is eventually it going to pop? And what people always like to throw out there is like, well, the video game bubble, blah, blah, blah. And there certainly is some truth to the video game bubble per se, where uh, Atari and back in the days, and it almost destroyed the hobby. But it did not destroy video gaming. Video gaming is thriving and doing well. And then some people say, well, look at board gaming today. I saw, I mean, video gaming today. Some people mentioned that and said, I don't want board gaming to follow video games. And I love video games. They, they churn out all these games that are kind of for the masses. But I think that's a fair thing. Let's look at video games today. Now, I'm not as old as some of you folks watching the videos, but I grew up with video games. I grew up in, uh, let's see, when I was a, uh, a young boy, Atari was still pretty big, Nintendo had just shown up, and Super Mario, and we were playing games. And a lot of kids had Nintendos, but that was almost exclusively male, and it was almost exclusively derided by parents as a whole. Parents bought their kids video games, but most parents kind of sneered and looked down at video games. Very few adults that we knew had video games. Arcades were kind of these seedy places that you went to and played, and they were super fun to play with. But despite movies like Tron and yeah, you know, there was a, the, the, the Wizard movie or whatever these movies were called, for the most part, video games were kind of the nerd geek thing to do. Let's fast forward to today. Every single one of my daughters really enjoy video games. Video games are everywhere. They are, uh, we can play them on all the devices in the house from the computers. You can play flash games for free all day long and you can buy other computer games. Um, there are the iPad and the iPhone and uh, uh, the Android tablets and all the different phones have them. There, I even have a game for my watch. Um, there's games on the TVs and, and my wife plays them. My kids play them and everyone seems to really enjoy them. So if I don't want board games to be like that, I would think there's something wrong with me. Video games no longer are a boy's world. That's fantastic. Everyone is welcome to play video games, and it's a very wide open thing. You go to a video game convention, and there's all people of all ages. It's no longer frowned upon by many people. That's exciting. So that's great. And if board games follows that same route, ching. Now, Video gaming has also diversified. Sure, the games like Mario Party and things that appeal to masses are the most common things. Temple Run and Bejeweled and things like that. I don't know that that's bad because even though those games are the most popular, you can find almost any game you want. You can find a die-hard political game a computer game if you want to, or an economic game. You can have flash games that you play all the time on the internet, once every day or more, multiple times a day. Um, massive multiplayer online games or just quick puzzle games. There are video game versions that, that they're for everyone. And even though maybe the bigger studios are pu publishing things that they know the most people buy, there are many independent studios everywhere publishing all kinds of unique, weird, interesting things that just kind of boggle your mind. The selection in the video gaming industry is massive. Why would I not want board games to be the same way? I can't get upset. Let's let's say, uh, let's pick a game I'm not a huge fan of, Munchkin. Let's say Munchkin would just really hit it big and was in stores everywhere and I walked in the street, people play Munchkin, I go to church and like, hey, you see the newest Munchkin set? I could survive on that because they're playing games and that's exciting to me. They don't have to be playing the same games that I'm playing. And even if that's true, the bigger the industry gets, the more fringe stuff can survive on the outsides. And I go, yeah, yeah, not everyone's playing Super Mario. Some people are playing some of these smaller, cool indie games. And that same thing can exist in board games. The bigger the industry gets, the more people come, and they might just get attracted over here by this weird, interesting little game. So do I want board games to follow that? Definitely. So I think those are my two main reasons when people say, do you want board games to be like video games? My answer is yes, I do. I want them to be everywhere. Pokemon has a Super Bowl commercial this year. I'm 
excited about that. I don't care anything about Pokemon, but I'm glad to see someone getting that kind of recognition. And I would love to see more of it. Video games have been on TV commercials for a long time. I'd love to see board gaming get to that point also. Now, where I might not want to see video game board games be like video games is possibly not all, of course, and there are many great video game uh, online communities, but there are some really horrific, toxic um, video game communities and the whole uh, gamers, gator, all that stuff that happened mostly. I guess last year was a big chunk of it. That was, you know, video games. It didn't really seep too much into board games, and you, you can stay over there, okay? And there's a whole lot of the... Uh, the way people treat each other on online video games and such. But still, you know, the other night I walked in, my wife was playing a video game, my daughters were over there all playing Mario Kart and stuff, and I'm thinking, this is so different than my childhood. And I'm glad, because it's gotten better. I'm hoping that when my kids have kids, the same thing will be said about board games. Well, they will go to a convention, and that convention will be filled with people from all different ages, from kids to adults, and uh, both genders, and all different um, just cultures in there, and everyone's just having bonding over the love for the same thing, board games. So I guess if you ask me about the board game bubble, it might pop, but we'll just blow another one and make that one bigger. And the bigger it gets, in my opinion, the better it is for everyone. I know a lot of you out there are very self-centered. Maybe not watching this video, but people I've seen here, they're like, I don't care if board gaming gets bigger or not. Well, maybe you don't, and that's fine. You have your own group of people, and you, you all play games together, and you don't care if anyone else in the world ever plays games. But, you know, some people want to buy the world of Coke. I want the world to play games, and I think it would be better if it did. Suzanne here with this week's feature board game app. Sports themed games aren't as common in the board gaming world as fantasy or sci-fi ones, but maybe throwing in some cybernetics and robotics would spice things up. Well, that's what Baseball Highlights 2045 did and the app is out for tablets, so let's take a quick look. Baseball Highlights 2045 is a deck building game tied to a futuristic baseball theme. Cards represent players that have hits and or defensive or other special abilities. You play in a series of quick games between which you get a chance to improve your team by buying new cards and sending others to the miners. The gameplay is designed around the idea that baseball can be slow and boring, so the theme and the mechanisms work to address that. The play involves a lot of back and forth between players, and each game is just six cards per player. Fair disclosure, I like baseball, and I'm a fan of Baseball Highlights 2045 in real life. The app version looks good overall. There is a thorough chapter tutorial as well as a complete rulebook in-app. However, I could imagine that if you don't have some basic familiarity with how baseball works in real life, some of the intricacies could be confusing to learn from the app. But the user interface is easy enough to use, and it's awesome that it released on Android and iOS, even though it's for tablets only. On the downside, there is no online play available right now. Because of the back and forth of the gameplay, I can understand that asynchronous play might not work, but real-time online play would be awesome. And randomly, the sliding between the team boards can be a bit dizzying, so if you're prone to motion sickness, be aware. Finally, for this app to really shine, they need to make the expansions available as well as the different game modes because experimenting with teams and customizing the game experience is a key factor to what makes this game so fun in real life. Baseball Highlights 2045 is a solid start to an app and one of my favorite deck builders, and I don't think you need to enjoy baseball to enjoy this game. I'm glad to have the app and am hoping that the expansions come sooner than later. But until then, play ball! Hello chaps and chappets! Would you like to see a brand new game which is fresh? Uh, uh, from France! This is Lutus, a simultaneous bidding game for two to five players. In the middle of the table, you'll create a market of people and places. The people deck includes blacksmiths, bakers, druids, bartenders, apprentices that can be attached to any of the four traits, and Roman soldiers that can be sacrificed as antes. The places deck includes Buildings that give you money for the resources you have. Buildings that give you victory points at the end of the game for the resources you have. Shopping lists which give you victory points. And statues that give you victory points for special buildings. Players will have a small hand of cards and five sisters. 
Players will simultaneously play two of their cards face down on the table and maybe place an ante on it. When this is done, everyone reveals. If a player plays a money card, they get that much money. Then you go through the market alphabetically to see who has won what. If no one has bid on the item, it gains a sister, making it more tasty for the next round. If there is at least one bid on an item, that player pays the cost and then takes that item. If two or more players have bid on the same item and there's no ante, that item just goes out of the game. But if someone has played an ante, the highest ante wins the game. They lose their ante, but they get the item paying the cost. The game continues just to the point where you cannot fill the market up and then you do the final scoring. Players get big points if they have the most of each one of the four resources or zero points if they have the least. You will score points for the shopping lists you've made and the statues you've built, points for any Romans unused and points for any special buildings you've built. Oh, and points for any money left over too. Highest score wins, yes. Lutus, you may wish to bid on this item when it comes to a market near you, but when will that be? Should have said bar. Hello, today I'm going to introduce you to the two to four player game Biblios, designed by Steve Finn. If you want a game that relies on strategy and rewards or punishes you based on your own skill a little more than it does on luck, then Biblios might just be the game for you. Players are abbots of their own monasteries, vying to attract or purchase the best monks, pigments, holy books, manuscripts, and forbidden tomes. If you're attracted to the concept of drafting, auction, and set collection mechanics, then this could be the perfect one to pick up and play for you. What attracted me to this game in the first place was the way that your decisions influence the game, not just for yourself, but for your opponents as well. Each turn, you draw a number of cards from the deck, equal to the number of players plus one, but only one at a time. One of these you may take into your hand and keep. One will go into the auction pile face down for the second half of the round, and the rest are placed face up for your opponents to draft from. This leads to a very delicious kind of dilemma. Get greedy too early, and you may be forced to give your opponents a better card. But equally, if you wait for the last card, it might actually turn out to be the weak link in that round. While you don't know what card you're going to get, there is a strong sense that your opponents got the cards they did because of your actions. In the second half of the round, there is an auction. You take the cards that you gained in the first half of the round, and you use them to buy those that you placed into the face down auction pile. Now, while gold is used to bid on the five resources and also for the bishop's favor, you bid on the gold cards to get maybe better cards later on with a number of others. Now, this means that the one point resources you gave to your opponents earlier on in the game may actually suddenly be useful for them. There are repercussions in this game for every single choice that you make. There is a little luck of the draw, sure, but when to give a card to your opponents is much more important. And that raises this, for me, far above many other auction bidding and drafting games. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Oh, hey, guys, the show is over. Thank you so much for watching Board Game Breakfast. We hope you come back next week. But in between then and now, there's a whole pile of stuff. I'll see you at 12.30 for the live Q&A. Until then, I'm Tom Basil, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.